Welcome everybody. Learning as a hobby here. Um, I wanted to, um, maybe I should preface this video with uh, what I'm doing here. Um, I wanted to, I know, I know that I said I was going to stick to the five books that I'm doing and I am still going to be doing those, but I did also mention, I kind of wanted to add uh, an aspect of two of the other subjects that I'm interested in here, which is history of math and um, cryptography. And I'm kind of getting impatient about that. So I do kind of, I think I want to start adding some videos on that uh, currently as well. So I still got chapter two for, for, its, um, for Taylor coming up. I still have, I'm still going to finish up chapter one in Simmons and in, in Schifrin and so on. Uh, we're still going to continue with those, but I'm also in addition going to add some, some content about the history of math and uh, about cryptography too, just because I just feel like I want to do that, right? I mean, it's a hobby. If I want to do something, I should do it. So uh, instead of placing those arbitrary, uh, you know, restrictions on myself, uh, I'm going to add this as, as, uh, current content to the channel as well. So um, for the history of math, uh, I think I I mentioned this before, but I want to go through a specific book, and it's by one of my favorite authors. It's this book here, Mathematics and Its History by John Stilwell. Uh, this is in the third edition. I believe this book first came out in like the 80s, um, so it's been revised a couple of times. Like I said, this is the third edition, so there was a first and a second edition um, that had less content than it. Um, but, you know, similar goals. So he has, in the third edition, added some extra content to, uh, from previous editions. Uh, I want to read, before, like I always do, I want to read the introduction to the first edition here. Uh, there is an introduction to the second and third edition, I believe, also, but usually the first edition gives you sort of like the pedagogical goals of the that the author had in writing the book. So I'll read uh, the preface one, uh, you know, the one, the preface for uh, the first edition uh, in the book. And then I want to go through um, section 1.1 and 1.2 in this book, and I'll post this, the uh, solutions to the exercise set for section 1.1, 1.2 in a separate video like I usually do. So let me start by um, reading through that prologue or that introduction. So like I said, there is a, a preface to the, the second and third edition, but I'm going to stick to the first edition here. So this, this is uh, John Stilwell speaking. One of the disappointments experienced by most, most mathematics students is that they never get a course on mathematics. They get courses in calculus, algebra, topology, and so on, but the division of labor in teaching seems to prevent these different topics from being combined into a whole. In fact, some of the most important and natural questions are stifled because they fall on the wrong side of topic boundary lines. Algebraists do not discuss the fundamental theorem of algebra because, quote, that's analysis. And analysts do not discuss Riemann surfaces because, quote, that's topology, for example. Thus, if students are to feel they really know mathematics by the time they graduate, there's a need to unify the subjects. Uh, this book aims to give a unified view of undergraduate mathematics by approaching the subject through its history. Since readers should have had some mathematical experience, certain basics are assumed and the mathematics is not developed formally as in a standard text. On the other hand, the mathematics is pursued more thoroughly than in most general histories of mathematics because mathematics is our main goal and history only the means of approaching it. Readers are assumed to know basic calculus, algebra, and geometry, to understand the language of set theory, and to have met some more advanced topics, such as group theory, topology, and differential equations. Uh, so uh, just speaking about that, you know, we can get to later chapters once we've done those topics on the channel as well. Okay, um, just continuing. I have tried to pick out the dominant themes of this body of mathematics and to weave them together as strongly as possible by tracing their historical development. In doing so, I have also tried to tie up some traditional loose ends. For example, undergraduates can solve quadratic equations. Why not cubics? They can integrate 1 over square root 1 minus x squared, but are told not to worry about 1 over 1, sorry, 1 over square root 1 minus x to the 4. Why? Pursuing the history of these questions turns out to be very fruitful, leading to a deeper understanding of complex analysis and algebraic geometry, among other things. Thus, I hope that the book will be not only <clears throat> a 
a bird's eye view of undergraduate mathematics, but also a glimpse of wider horizons. Some historians of mathematics may object to my anachronistic use of modern notation and fairly modern interpretations of classical mathematics. This has certain risks, such as making the mathematics look simpler than it really was in its time, but the risks the risk of obscuring ideas by cumbersome, unfamiliar notation is greater, in my opinion. Indeed, it is practic it sorry, it is practically a truism that mathematical ideas generally arise before there is a notation uh, or language to express them clearly, and that ideas are implicit before they become explicit. Thus, the historian who is presumably trying to be both clear and explicit often has no choice but to be anachronistic when tracing the origin of ideas. Mathematicians may object to my choice of topics since a book of this size is necessarily incomplete. My preference has been for topics with elementary roots and strong interconnections. The major themes are the concepts of number and space, their initial separation in Greek mathematics, their union in the geometry of Fermat and Descartes, and the fruits of this union in calculus and analytic geometry. Certain important topics of today, such as Lie groups and functional analysis, are omitted on the grounds of their comparative remoteness from elementary roots. Uh, just a side note, he uh, in later editions, he did add that content. So there, are, there is uh, chapters on Lie groups and so on uh, in this in the third edition. So just like I said before, I'm reading the, the preface to the first edition before he made those changes. So uh, continuing, others such as probability theory are mentioned only briefly, as most of their development seems to have occurred outside the mainstream. For any other omissions or slights, I can only plead personal taste and a desire to keep the book within the bounds of a one or two semester course. The book has grown from notes for a course given to senior undergraduates at Monash University over the past few years. The course was of half semester length and a little over half the book was covered. <clears throat> Uh, apparently that covered chapter one through 11 one year and chapters five through 15 another year. Naturally, I will be delighted if other universities decide to base a course on the book. There's plenty of scope for custom course design by varying the periods or topics discussed. However, the book should serve equally well as general reading for the student or professional mathematician. Biographical notes are have been inserted at the end of each chapter, partly to add human interest, but also to help trace the transmission of ideas from one mathematician to another. These notes have been distilled mainly from secondary sources, the Dictionary of Scientific Biography, or DSB, normally being used in addition to the sources and sorry, to the sources cited explicitly. I have followed the DSB's practice of describing the subject's uh, mother by her maiden name, References are cited in the names uh, year form. For example, Newton 1687 refers to the Principia, and the references are collected at the end of the book. The manuscript has been read carefully, and then he thanks some people, so I'll skip that part. But uh, that's the preface from John Stilwell, Stilwell when he was at, I don't know if he's still at this university, but from when he was at Monash University in Australia, uh, and he it signed the year 1989. So this book came out in, in the 80s, like I said. Um, so there's a lot of references also in the big bibliography here, uh, most of which I don't have, obviously, because uh, there's so many. But I do have a bunch of them, particularly for the Greek mathematics sections, I do have a lot of the texts that I need, uh, some of which I'll talk about today because he refers to them in, in section 1.1, 1.2. So let's get into uh, those sections. I'll, I'll give you my summary of uh, section 1.1, 1.2, like I normally do. When I get to the exercise set, as I always uh, suggest, try doing the problems yourself first before looking at anyone else's solutions. Uh, just to, um, as a side note, also, I don't as far as I know, I don't believe there are solutions available to the exercises in this book. Uh, if you do know of a solutions manual or something, uh, maybe you can leave the information in the uh, in the the uh, co the um, comments down below. But as far as I know, I, I'm not aware of any solution manual here. But the problems are interesting and so on. So we'll, you know, we'll go through the problems. Uh, just like we are within all the other textbooks that we're doing, but that'll be in a separate video. All right, so let me bring up my notes and um, remember that my notes here are just an outline of the chapter. So you should actually read the book yourself, uh, the chapter yourself, if you are interested in, oh, did I not bring up the, uh, hang on one second, I gotta, 
Oops, what did I just do? I got to bring up the uh, the summary. Hang on one second. Um, what was I saying? Oh, you should read the section yourself, obviously. Um, sorry, sorry for the awkwardness. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can share my screen now. Um, here we go. Okay, so here's here's my my notes. Uh, sorry, let, let me go back to what I was saying. You should read the section yourself because again, this is just a, a you know a skeleton of the chapter, just a uh, an outline of the base the main ideas in the section. Uh, there's a lot more information that still will gives in the sections that are worth reading on their own. So in and in detail. So uh, section one point one and one point two starts on the Pythagorean theorem, and he says that uh, the P Pythagorean theorem is. Uh, a very important theorem in history. It's in fact probably one of the one of the first really deep theorems in mathematics, um, and most people usually remember the Pythagorean theorem from their school days. Uh, and the reason that it's important is it gives a link between the concept of number, geometry, and infinity. Uh, it it leads towards numbers in that uh, you know Pythagorean triples are the the numbers that satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, it leads to geometry and the, the geometric interpretation of the Pythagorean theorem in terms of right triangles, which uh, I'm sure everybody remembers from high school. Uh, and it also uh, involves the concept in, of infinity. For example, uh, it gives the number root two, uh, the num you could use the number root two as a solution. Root two is an irrational number. Uh, if you use the Pythagorean theorem to find the diagonal of a square, let's say, of side length one, the diagonal has length root two, right, by the Pythagorean theorem, root two is not rational. And that was something that, uh, you know, upset the, the Greek world of mathematics way back in the day, because uh, the, Pythag the school of Pythagoreans, uh, which was a sort of mathematical cult, it was, you know, it was a religious movement, um, there, they built their ideas on the fact that the world uh, was number, was made out of number. And by number, they meant rational numbers. So the fact that there was uh, a, a irrational number um, involved in something so simple as calculating the length of the diagonal of a, a unit square was was very upsetting at first. So anyway, uh, let's, let's get to um, more of the material here. So the fusion of number and geometry is explored at the end of this chapter where a squared plus b squared equals c squared is used to define the concept of distance. So we'll do that later on in, in the chapter. Okay, um, again, here's the geometry behind the theorem. Um, a squared plus c squared equals c squared, which is called the, the Pythagorean theorem. I'm sure all of you guys recognize it. It's a statement about um, well, the way that the Greeks did it, really, it was a statement about areas. So if you have a right triangle like I have drawn here, and you make a square on the uh, on the line segments that make up the sides of the triangle, then the, the square on the sum of the squares on the legs should be equal to the square of the hypotenuse. That's that's the interpretate the geometric interpretation um, in Greek mathematics. It's a like I said, a, it's a um, a theorem about areas. But, you know, we could also, um, nowadays we think about it as in terms of lengths. So here you, uh, you could think of it also as the sum of uh, the squares of the lengths of the, the legs of the right triangle is equal to the, the square of the length of the hypotenuse. All right. Um, so a solution to the Pythagorean theorem can be realized by a right angled triangle with sides A, B and hypotenuse C. So, you know, if you have um, two uh, two point uh, two points. You can draw a um, a horizontal and a sorry a horizontal and a vertical line. And if you connect the the two points with the shortest distance between them, you get the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And uh, you get you know these are some numbers that satisfy that relationship. So uh, the number three four five satisfy is a Pythagorean triple because it satisfies the Pythagorean. Um, the Pythagorean theorem. In other words, three squared plus four squared is five squared. Also, another one that you probably remember from high school is the five, 12, 13 triangle. Five squared plus 12 squared is 13 squared. So that's another example of a Pythagorean triple. And there's an infinite number of them. Uh, later on uh, in, in this section, we'll actually derive a general formula for, um, for, the, for getting Pythagorean triples, right? Um, and then he just talks a little bit about, you know, some of the history here. It's conjectured 
uh, I, I don't know if it, if it's ever been confirmed or anything, but it's conjectured that in ancient times, Pythagorean triples were used to construct right triangles. And he gives an example here. <clears throat> if you take a rope with 12 equally spaced knots, you can construct uh, a right triangle using the rope. So, you know, notice that you have, um, you know, let me get my pen. So here you have a three, right? This is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and five, one, two, three, four, five, right? This is a three, four, five triangle, which is a right triangle. So you can use the you use that fact to construct right triangles using like a, like he says here, a rope uh, with twelve equally spaced knots on it. Okay, um, the Pythagorean theorem was the first hint of a hidden relationship between arithmetic and geometry. Back in ancient times, they they assumed that the two subjects were um, completely unrelated to each other. There, you know, numbers were numbers, and geometric objects were geometric objects. Uh, arithmetic is based on counting. In other words, it's a discrete process, whereas geometry involves continuous objects like lines, curves, and surfaces. Uh, and these continuous objects can't be built by discrete processes. Uh, and also geometry has the added, um, the added, uh, what's the word, uh, aspect of being um, seen rather than calculated. Uh, the tension between arithmetic and geometry, and going back to what I said at the beginning, for example, the fact that square root two is irrational, has led to profound theorems, uh, many of which we'll explore in the book later on. So, okay, um, Pythagorean triples uh, clearly were talked about by the Pythagoreans. Pythagoras was uh, is assumed to have lived around, not assumed, but they think that. Pythagoras lived around 500 BCE, uh, that stands for before Common Era. Um, but the Pythagorean theorem was known uh, well before the, the Pythagoreans existed. Um, they think it, it's, it was known all the way back, uh, even maybe to, to 1800 BCE in Babylon. Uh, and the reason they, they know that is because of some artifacts that have been found. Uh, for Most explicitly, uh, this one that's called Plimpton 322, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, Plimpton 322 is a clay tablet that's uh, written in cuneiform uh, that lists a large number of integer pairs, A and C, for which there is an integer B satisfying the Pythagorean theorem. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Uh, it was first translated and interpreta interpreted by Negebauer and Sachs in 1945. They wrote a book about it. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have that book. Um, I think you could still maybe read it online, uh, or you can buy the book still too. But uh, I don't, I don't have it, so I can't really talk about that. Uh, he also says, also see Vander Warden, um, and I do have Vander Warden's book. Uh, what he means? Let me just pa let me just uh, pause the screen share for a second. This is the book he's referring to by Van der Warden. It's There's actually two volumes, and I have both of them. This is the first volume, uh, Geometry and Algebra in Ancient Civilizations. Um, by, where's the author's name? Uh, here you go. Um, B.L. Van der Warden is a famous uh, mathematician and uh, mathematics historian. I believe he was a student of Emmy Noether, if I'm not uh, remembering incorrectly, you can correct me in the in the comments if if I'm thinking of somebody else. But I believe he was a student of Emmy Noether. Um, so he has he has a whole uh, two these two volumes on the history of algebra and geometry in ancient civilizations. His whole first chapter one is on the Pythagorean theorem, uh, not only in ancient Greece but also in other ancient cultures, which is what um, Stillwell is referring to here. Uh, I. I am going to go over some of the material that he refers to in other books in this video, but I'm not going to go over chapter one in Vander Warden here because it's a long chapter. And when he, when he says see Vander Warden, he means see the entire chapter one of Vander Warden's first volume <laughs> here. So I might have, I'll, I'll make a, a separate video about chapter one um, just because he does refer to it in, in uh, Stillwell. Uh, so, but I'll do that in another video. But anyway, this is the book that he's referring to. Um, so just going back 
uh, to my notes here. I want to show you what Plimpton 322 looks like. So maybe I'll show that first before I go back to my notes. All right, this is the 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 clay tablet that he's referring to called Plimpton 322. Uh, this is from ancient Babylon. And as I said, it's written in cuneiform. Uh, the way that they used to do this was they would take a clay block and they would take a, a like a little stylus and they would make these like wedge type shapes uh, on the uh, the clay. And then they would bake them in an oven so that they became hardened. And uh, we have a lot of these because they because of the medium that they recorded these things on, you know, the clay tablets, they last for a long time. So we actually have um, archaeological, you know, records of a lot of these these clay tablets, which unfortunately we don't have uh, equivalent amount of information from uh, or artifacts from uh, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece because they used more um, uh, not as long lasting medium to write on, like they use papyrus and things like that, which decays over time, unfortunately. But uh, this is the, the the clay tablet that he's referring to. So the, on written on this tablet are no, a bunch of uh, pairs of numbers for which there is another number that satisfies the Pythagorean um, theorem. Now, these are written in base 60 because the Babylonians counted in base 60. Uh, in the exercise set for this for this session section, uh, we're going to do some problems involving um, Plimpton 322, so I won't talk too much about it anymore here because we'll we'll actually look at um, Plimpton uh, 322, the numbers that are on here. We'll look at them in detail in the exercise set, which I said is going to do. We're going to do we'll do that in another video. But anyway, I wanted you guys to see what it looked like. So this is the the clay tablet. Let me go back to my notes here. Okay. Um, uh, so he says, see Van der Warden, um, 1983, which is the book I showed you. <clears throat> and Van der Warden talks about the fact that Pythagorean triples were considered interesting in other ancient civilizations, which means that the, you know, the Pythagorean theorem was known in other ancient civilizations besides ancient Greece. Uh, for example, in China, um, there are works that, uh, study Pythagorean triples um, that are dated to the to around 200 BCE to 220 CE. Um, BCE, again, remember, I, I said stands for before common era and CE stands for common era. And also in India from 500 BCE to 200 BCE. Uh, and again, chapter one of the Van der Warden book talks about that in detail. So we'll look at that in another video. Right, uh, but he says the most complete understanding of Pythagorean of the Pythagorean theorem in antiquity was achieved by the Greeks, uh, particularly um, Euclid talks um, about it in his book, The Elements. Um, Euclid, they think, lived around 300 BCE, uh, and Diophantus also uh, ha talks about the Pythagorean theorem in his book, uh, and he lived around 250 CE. And again, let me just stop for one second. Stop my screen share for one second. Um, I want to talk about. Um, I have a copy of Euclid's Elements. This is all te all uh, thirteen books of Euclid's Elements. This was I got this a long time ago. Um, it was put out by Barnes and Noble Press. Um, it has an introduction by Andrew Aberdeen. Um, complete and unabridged this this version that barnes and noble put out first of all it has everything in one volume so all all 13 books are in here um this is the version that was um annotated by the famous uh, mathematics historian uh thomas heath of whose i have uh many i have many of thomas heath's books which i'll talk about you know eventually um this is his you know commentary his uh version of Euclid's Elements um, with Thomas Heath's commentary. Now, this book, I would not recommend getting, uh, this version, I mean, I would not recommend getting the, the Barnes & Noble version with all 13 books in one uh, volume. And the reason for that, it's really hard to read because it's so huge. Uh, like, you can't, it's hard to, to even open up the book without, like, breaking the spine. So I would not recommend getting this version. But uh, Thomas Heath does have uh, published by Dover Press, uh, all of Euclid's elements, but it's in three different volumes. So uh, I think volume one is like books one and two. Volume um, volume two does you know several more of the books, and then volume three finishes up all the rest of the the books that chapter that uh, volume one and volume two didn't, didn't cover. 
uh, I would suggest getting those just because, like I said, the, for the ease of reading, uh, this is not an easy volume to read through. It's not convenient or, or fun to read through this just because of the way that it's it's made. Um, but I have it, so uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, the uh, extra step of buying the, the other book. So I'll, I'll use this one. Uh, but just as a recommendation, I would say avoid getting this Barnes & Noble's version. Uh, get get them in separate books. It'll be easier to work through them. Um, and I I did, what we'll see later on, um, I actually went through Euclid's proof of the general form of uh, the formula that we're going to look at in a minute in a minute in book 10. So I'll talk about that later. Uh, but I, I went through the, the proof in here um, and I'll outline that later on in this video. Uh, I also have a copy of Diophantus also uh, with the annotations by Sir Thomas Heath. Um, this one, I, I didn't look at the Pythagorean theorem in uh, because uh, Stillwell doesn't give a reference to where to look for it in here. And uh, it's, there's no, no list of the topics in um, Diophantus's Arithmetica here. It just lists the book, uh, the chapter numbers. So I don't know if this will show up in the video, but it just says, you know, book one, book two, et cetera, for the Arithmetica. It doesn't tell you what the topics are. So I, I just didn't, I, you know, I didn't feel like going through the whole book looking for the Pythagorean theorem. So unfortunately, but maybe he'll refer to it later and we could look at Diophantus's version. Um, but I do have that book. Uh, and also, maybe while I'm here, um, I also have uh, Thomas Heath's A History of Greek Mathematics, uh, which is written in two volumes. Uh, this is volume one, where he talks about the, uh, from Thales to uh, to Euclid. So the Pythagorean theorem is in here, and Stillwell refers to it. We'll go through actually the, the part here that he talks about in Stillwell, or that he refers to in Stillwell. I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let me go back to the, my notes now. Uh, it would, if you want to follow along with the video, I'd say it would be useful to get a copy of Heath um, and also a copy of uh, Euclid. That might be useful to have if you're interested in the history of math. Um, okay, but anyway, that's just an aside. Let me go back to the notes here. <clears throat> Okay, so like he like he says, uh, the most complete understanding in antiquity of the Pythagorean theorem was achieved by the Greeks, uh, outlined in Euclid. So, and like I said, Diophantus also uh, has a, a treatment of the Pythagorean theorem in his book, The Arithmetica. Okay, so there is a general formula for the Pythagorean triples. Uh, we'll derive this formula in several different ways. Um, in this section, we'll de we'll derive it. Well, well, you'll see when I when I get to it in a minute. Um, so here, a squared plus b squared equals c squared uh, works uh, if a is of the form p squared minus q squared times r, b is of the form 2pqr, and c is of the form p squared plus q squared times r. Uh, here, I'm, when I say uh, satisfies the equation, I'm, I'm assuming that we're looking at um, integer solutions of the Pythagorean theorem. Obviously, if you let a, b and, c, a and b be any real numbers, then, you know, it works for, you know, you'll always get a solution. Uh, it gives you this, uh, you know, a circle if you look at that. Um, it's plausible that the Babylonians used this formula as the basis for the Pythagorean triples in Plimpton 322. What, why do we know that? Um, well, that's something that we'll explore in the exercises. So I'll I'll hold off on talking about why he, he says this. Uh, when we get to the exercise set, because that's one of the reasons that we're that uh, some of the problems are there in the exercise set for this section. So, but uh, it, it's it's plausible, though not guaranteed. You know, we don't know for sure whether they the Babylonians had a formula like this for creating uh, Pythagorean triples. But from Plimpton three twenty two, it the way that it's set up uh, at least makes it plausible that they they probably did. Um, okay. Less general formulas are attrib attributed to Pythagoras and to Plato, and I'll show you those those uh, formulas down below. We'll derive them in a second. Um, an equivalent general solution is given in Euclid's El uh, Euclid's Elements, Book Ten, the lemma following Proposition Twenty Eight. Again, we'll look at that uh, in a minute. Uh, Euclid's proof is essentially arithmetical. 
whereas Diophantus gives a solution which uses the geometric interpretation of Pythagorean triples. Now, in this video, we will look at Euclid's proof, but um, like I said, I, I haven't looked at Diophantus's proof uh, because Stillwell didn't give a reference to it. Uh, so maybe we'll look at it, look at Diophantus later on. Um, but I'm not going to do that in this video because I didn't look at his his uh, proof. So, but anyway, uh, let's start with Heath. So I, I want to derive. We'll start by deriving um, Pythagoras's uh, formula for finding Pythagorean triples. This is remember this is the general solution here, and then we'll look at Plato's, and then we'll look at Euclid's. All right. So starting. Uh, so this is from. Uh, Keith's book, A History of Greek Mathematics, Volume 1, the one that I showed you guys a minute ago, that's this one, um, pages. Uh, now, Stillwell actually gives uh, di the different page numbers for where this is, and maybe that's because he had a different um, a different version of the book or, or a different ed edition of the book. Uh, in my edition, but put out by Dover, it's pages 79 to 82. So if you have my version, uh, you know, the one that put out by Dover, just be aware it's the page numbers are slightly different. Um, so if you if you look at this um, the way that we're constructing these squares that I have this picture that I have drawn on the side, um, if you make a square out of you know this dot diagram, where's my pen? Uh, so for example, you know if you have one dot, one is a square. If you um, have a square of side two, right? The square is four. If you have a square of side three, the square is nine and so on and so on. Notice that the way you get those squares, notice that the way you get those squares is by adding uh, consecutive odd numbers. So in other words, one is one squared. One plus three is four, which is two squared. Uh, one plus two plus, uh, sorry, one plus three plus five is nine, which is three squared, and so on and so on. In fact, this is a formula. If you add the first n uh, consecutive odd numbers, it always gives you a perfect square. So one plus three plus five plus dot 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 up to two n minus one is always equal to n squared, which you can prove using induction, but I'll, I'll skip it here because um, we'll, we'll probably end up talking about induction later on. But uh, I skipped the proof of that here. It's a simple um, proof by mathematical induction, which you might actually want to try if, you, if you've never done it. Um, you can prove that formula. Uh, so just using that formula, though, if you look, if you take the sum of the first n plus one nat uh, odd numbers, in other words, one plus three plus five plus dot, 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 plus two n minus one plus two n plus one, that's the sum of the first n plus one odd numbers that's equal to n plus one squared. And if you regroup the terms here, so if you regroup the terms like this, then notice that this is actually n squared and we're left with two n plus one over here. And we have an n plus one squared on the right-hand side of the equation. Now from that, oops, let me stop this. Okay. Um, you get a Pythagorean triple when 2n plus 1 is a perfect square. So, you know, one way you can construct uh, Pythagorean triples is just by, you know, using this fact about the sums of odd numbers and stop when you get, you know, uh, to a perfect square, uh, an odd number that's a perfect square, and you'll get, you'll have a Pythagorean triple by using this fact. Um, but we want to have a, a, a formula that gives us, you know, the three numbers all at once. So we know that th that would be a solution to the Pythagorean theorem if 2n plus 1 is a perfect square. In other words, if 2n plus 1 is m squared, then we can solve that for the, the number n. That means that n would have to be m squared minus 1 over 2. Right, which implies that uh, m squared minus 1 over 2 squared plus m squared equals m squared plus 1 over 2 squared. In other words, you get a solution to the, the Pythagorean, uh, sorry, uh, you get a solution to the Pythagorean theorem, which gives you a Pythagorean triple. Um, so it's thought that this is the way that Pythagoras discovered uh, his version of the general formula for uh, Pythagorean triples. This is not completely general. Um, this formula will give you the solutions um, to uh, Pythagorean triples that have no common, that are relatively prime to each other. Um, 
in this derivation, uh, it's not completely general notice because in this derivation, m must be odd in order for m squared minus one over two and m squared plus one over two to be integers. Um, in other words, these you know m squared minus one and m squared plus one have to be even, have to be divisible by two in order to get an integer when you divide them by two. So uh, uh, Pythagoras's formula here assumes that m is m squared is an odd number. Oh, sorry, m is an odd number, uh, which implies that m squared is an odd number. Uh, Plato also has a formula, uh, but he his formula is a little bit more general. It doesn't assume that uh, m has to be odd. So let's see his derivation. So in the dot picture, notice that n squared minus n minus 1 squared is equal to 2n minus 1 if, in general, and n plus 1 squared minus n squared is 2n plus 1 in general. Then if you take the sum of those uh, two things, n squared minus n minus 1 squared plus n plus 1 squared minus n squared is equal to 4n, which is, if you simplify the you know the left-hand side, is equal to n plus 1 squared minus n minus 1 squared. If n is equal to m squared, then you get the Pythagorean a solution to the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so you get you know 2m all squared plus m squared minus 1 squared equals m squared plus 1 squared. Uh, first off, you can get this version from the uh, Pythagoras's uh, formula by just doubling the sides of the square that you're looking at. So it's it's uh, you can go back and forth between them. Um, this one's a little bit more general, though, because this doesn't make assumptions about m being odd. So, but that th that was uh, a formula that was in Plato's, I guess, in Plato's works. Um, so those are two derivations of the the formulas for Pythagorean triples from antiquity. There's also the version that's uh, in Euclid's Elements, which we'll look at last, which is the most general of of all of them. Uh, and in fact, the formula that Euclid derives is completely equivalent to the, the general form that we have up here, which is the more general, uh, w the more modern way that it, that the formulas are written. Okay, um, this derivation is in book 10 of Euclid. Uh, it's lemma two, sorry, lemma one after proposition 28. So here in, in this lemma, he gives a straight line segment here. Uh, C is the point halfway between A and B, and you extend that to get to the point D. So all of these are collinear, these these points. All right, by book two, proposition six in Euclid, um, you have this fact. I won't derive it. It's, it's derived in Euclid's book, so we're just going to use it as a lemma. Um, so by that proposition, it says that AD times BD times BD plus CB squared equals CD squared, right? Um, from that formula that we have there, like I said, that is derived in book two of Euclid. Uh, let's sort of do the, this derivation in a more modern way. Uh, let u equal a, the length ad, let v equal the, the length db, x equals cb, and y equals cd. Then uh, an equivalent way of writing that formula would be uv plus x squared equals y squared. In other words, uv equals y squared minus x squared, which is the difference of two squareds. So in other words, u is equal to y minus x, and v is equal to um, y plus x. And solving that system of linear equations for x and y, you get that x is 1 half times u minus v, and then y is 1 half times u plus v. Right, and then here I need a definition. By Euclid, u times v is a perfect square if either u v are perfect squares or u and v are similar plane numbers. So let me let me define what Euclid means by similar plane numbers. So u v u and v are similar plane numbers if u is m p times n p and v is m q times n q for some natural numbers m n p n q and just to, so you can get an intuitive sense of what that's saying what what it means is if you have so if you let u be the area of this um, quadrilateral here this rectangle and uh, v be the area of this this uh, rectangle. Uh, so that's equal to m and q squared, and and uh, u is equal to m and p squared. In other words, the dimensions of the big rectangle are m p by n p, and the dimensions of the smaller rectangle are m q 
by NQ. What we mean by U and V being similar plane numbers is that if you take the, the corresponding ratio of the sides, it's constant. So if you take MP divided by MQ, notice that ratio is the same as P over Q and NP over NQ, you get the same ratio. Uh, what that means is that these are similar plane objects, similar, similar plane figures, right? Uh, or you could say these are similar rectangles. So that's what the, the definition of similar plane numbers uh, means, All right? So uh, a fact from Euclid is that U and V are a perfect square, uh, sorry, U times V is a perfect square. If U times, if U and V are per both perfect squares or if U and V are similar plane numbers, All right? So using that fact, and uh, plugging in for uh, into the formula here. So in other words, assuming that u is m n p squared and v is m n q squared for some natural numbers m n p and q, then we get uh, using the formulas. Remember, x is one half uh, u minus v and y is one half uh, u plus v. So just plugging those numbers in, those uh, expressions in. Uh, and then plugging the values for u and v in, you get this formula here, which is the general formula for Pythagorean triples. Uh, in this case, just to relate this to the general formula that we had written above the modern version, in this case, r is m n, okay? So let me just scroll back up so you can see again what that formula looked like. Uh, over here. Okay, so in this case, R is M times N uh, in Euclid's formula. All right, let me just scroll down to the end. Okay, so this gives a, an equivalent general formula for uh, generating Pythagorean triples. It implicitly contains both the Pythagorean and Platonic formulas that we showed above. Um, in that, uh, you know, if m times n is, uh, if m times n is one, then you get the, the Pythagorean version. Uh, and if m times n is two, then you get the platonic version. But this one is the most general because m and n could be any natural numbers. So that's it. That's uh, section 1.1 and 1.2 in Stillwell's book. Let me just stop the screen share. Um, so we'll continue with the, the exercise set for this in the next video in this you know series uh and at some point in the future it'll take me a while to read through chapter one of this book uh i'll make a, a short a short video on the uh on the well i don't know i can't assume that's gonna be short yet <laughs> i'll make a video on, ch on chapter one about this book at some point too um all right guys uh thanks for watching um please do like and subscribe if you enjoy seeing this content and keep an eye out for the exercise the video on the exercise set for chapter uh, one sections one and two, uh, which should be coming up shortly. Uh, I might actually be able to make it today. Also, uh, record the video today for that, uh, and then from there again, we'll we'll continue with. I, I have to finish up chapter two in uh, Taylor, and then you know chapter one in Simmons and in Schifrin. So those are, those are all things that are coming up. All right, so keep your your keep your eyes out for those. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until that time, keep learning, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.